Welcome folks, we're back, House Corrections and Institutions Committee, and this afternoon we're going to be dealing with the Department of Corrections. And we've got some areas that we're going to be looking at. A lot of this is background information so that we can start understanding the layout of corrections. We can under, start understanding uh, the facilities, the capacities of each of the facilities, the operating costs for each facility. So that is a dovetails of what we talked about this morning in terms of deferred maintenance and maintenance needs within each of our facilities. So it kind of brings it all together for us. And then we're going to transition into the incarcerated population in terms of the average population and then inmate population report, which does a deeper dive into folks who are incarcerated and why they are incarcerated, what they've been convicted of. So I'm going to turn it over to Al Cormier to get us started, and then and we will start with the facilities, um, individual facilities and their capacities. And we do have that on our web page, that document to bring up. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, Al Cormier, Chief of Operations for the Department of Corrections. Um, Jess King Moore is our lead research analyst for the department who has put this information together. And, and my apologies, I know you've gotten a couple different documents around the capacity and we spent some time with, with the COVID quarantine and isolation units and trying to figure out where it, it's, it's an ever evolving um, model for us as, as, as to where we're housing people. And as you know, Madam Chair, the the way our facilities are, are set up, it's, it's often a challenge finding adequate space. So what, what you have in front of you is um, the most current up-to-date accurate data that, that we do have. Um, so what, what this shows is facility capacity um, by our bed type pre-COVID and also post-COVID. So pre-COVID, um, you'll look at the general population, the special housing, beds and then the segregation beds of each of our facilities. Uh, special housing can include infirmary beds, um, intake and booking beds, our medical unit. Um, Southern State facility, you'll see the, uh, the highest in the state. That is um, our mental health population, our aged and infirm population. Again, the, the infirmary itself Northwest has, has quite a high number because of um, the uh, sex offender programming that, that goes on there. And then pre-COVID um, correctional facility in St. Johnsbury shows a high number because the work camp um, has historically been considered special housing, special population because of the criteria to get into either the work camp or the North unit population, um, which is our B1 pending release. So let me stop you there before you, this is pre-COVID. Pre-COVID. So for, this includes all of our facilities, um, including the work camp. And we have a total beds within our system of 1,579. Of the, of the 1,579, we have 412 beds that are restricted in their use. So maybe Al, you could talk about what it really means for general, op general population beds, how those are different than you're restricted. You're restricted are special housing or SEG units that are not open to general population. Can you sort of explain what that general population mix is? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So general population would consist of um, any living unit where there is not a, um, a requirement for programming, a mental health need, um, a classification designation that will, would require housing in a, in a special unit. Uh, again, that goes to like our sex offender programming, therapeutic beds, mental health beds. Um, and then our segregation units would be anywhere where we would house those individuals that would be difficult to manage, those that are either behavioral issues, um, 
designate a close custody in a facility that does not have a close custody unit. Um, protective custody. So if, if you have beds available that are not being used in special housing or in the SEG units, can you put general population folks in there? We would not mix that population, no. Could we do it? Yes, but it, operationally, it's it just it's not good business um, because of those segregation units just do not have the access to a, a television, um, access to the, the rec yard without utilizing special movement protocols in place. Um, the way those are set up, they're set up for single cells um, in, in a very restricted environment. So it's the way that that particular unit's been built? Correct. So then the, the general population units would be, again, those, those residing within the correctional facilities that don't have a designation for either requiring segregation or, or special housing programming. Um, so much more ability to enter a rec yard that is, that is outside. Uh, you know, access to the to library, education, um, a higher population in one unit. So with our supervision stand, direct supervision, you know, that's one officer to anywhere from 30 to 50 individuals at one time. We're in a, in a special housing unit. The numbers are reduced for more focus on one-on-one -on -one interaction. So questions from the committee at all? Do people understand the difference there in the housing and the ability? So there, at any point in time, we do have empty beds in our facilities, but those empty beds are mostly special housing and SEG units, correct? Correct. So we have folks who are out of state, um, a little bit over 100, 150 or so, and that varies. So we do have empty beds. How many? 184 today. 184 today. So we do have empty beds <clears throat> in our system at any point in time, but the issue is the folks from out of state could not come in and take one of those beds because they're more restrictive beds. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. And the, the other piece of that, Madam Secretary, Madam, sorry, Madam no, Chair. I'm not Secretary. <laughs> Madam Chair, um, <laughs> is the... Uh, um, Historically, with our population numbers as high as they have been in the past year, year and a half, um, St. Johnsbury and Marble Valley often had inmates sleeping on the floor. So even with free beds in segregation, we would often have our general population beds, while there may be 149 available in St. Johnsbury, there could at times be 170 inmates on our population count with inmates sleeping in sled beds on the floor, two people in a one-man cell or, or, or three in a, in a three-person cell. Um, so those are off, you know. So while we have a cap, it's often deceiving as to what our actual number is because you could say, okay, here's your capacity, but you have 200 more inmates than what your capacity is, and, and it would be inmates residing on the floors in our cells. Committee members get that? Okay, questions? Okay, let's go to the next um, page, which deals with post-COVID. So post-COVID, you're gonna see some changes. Overall population is, is going to be a difference of about 80 beds, 90 beds um, from our general population numbers total. Uh, and what you'll see is our segregation units have now been eliminated per se and have been taken over by a quarantine and isolation bed. So due to the, the protocols that we've put in place for COVID mitigation across all of our facilities, the majority of our segregation units are now in intake quarantine or intake isolation, depending on the facility. Um, so any inmate that is, is lodged at our facilities comes in and is tested for COVID is placed on a 14 day quarantine, tested again at day seven and tested again at day 12. Um, 
So you'll see the change in, in that, those housing numbers based on um, the changes we've made to each of our facilities and the roles of our facilities um, to adapt to our, our COVID protocols and, and our mitigation. So your population has gone down by about 100. Yes. Total. Um, your general population has, yeah, your general, your general population has gone down by about 200 because you had 1,167 general population pre-COVID and now there's 996. So I'm assuming those are actual folks, actual people, is that correct? Or is it So just our population, people? yeah, our population oh. January of 20 was around, I think it was around 1485. Today we're at, well, yes, do you have our population counts for today? find them right now. Would that population count include the out-of-state folks? It would. That's okay. I'm trying to find the breakdown on that right now. Um, sorry. No, that's fine. We can wait. Today's population is 1285. 1285. Okay. Um, and that's, so you take 184 off of that, so 1100 1100 in state right now so the biggest shift is those seg beds went into quarantine um in in isolation your uh special housing decreased a little bit one of the biggest decreases there is with uh, st johnsbury and the the as you know, the work camp has special criteria to get in as well as we've changed the, we've reduced the work camp population and then we have the B1 population in there. And we've been- <laughs> Can you explain what the B1 is? Cause I think for some folks that's a new terminology. Yes. So uh, B1 is a classification designation for those that are solely incarcerated because of lack of housing. Um, the only thing preventing them from being released to the community is that they don't have adequate housing available to them. Um, so this is a minimum custody population that is currently housed in North Unit in St. Johnsbury. Um, because of the special designation for work camp eligibility and the, the eligibility to get into North Unit, we've utilized the term special housing for that, but it's a, for, it, it can be a little deceiving saying, because we can put general population inmates in there. Um, and not that we have at this point, but it is an option for us. As, as we look at our COVID mitigation again and, and how we house and should we have a surge in our population. So we have changed that and adjusted those numbers um, and made those beds general population beds. So questions of the committee. We've got Michelle and then Karen. Yeah, I was just wondering, do you have a number? Like how many people are at that one B1 status right now? Uh, right now, there's there's 20, um, 26 inmates in St. Johnsbury on that status. 19 inmates, sorry. Cur currently, 19 inmates in St. Johnsbury on that on that B1 okay. status. There, I don't know the statewide total, um, Representative. There are more, but we've we've kind of left because of the open dorm environment in that facility. It's not cells. It's more like an army barracks. And as we've come to learn through our work with, with COVID that an open environment is not conducive to mitigating social distancing and, and reducing the spread of the, the virus. So we're, we're trying to minimize the number of people in that unit for that okay. purpose right now. Okay, Karen? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll thank you for these numbers. I appreciate it, kind of seeing the differences in them. Uh, I'm curious, because I think we're getting to, seeing that it's the seg beds that have had the biggest difference. I'm curious what that impact has been with the seg beds going down. I also know that seg beds can be seen as controversial because they're, you know, people are isolated. Um, they're used for disciplinary or safety measures. 
So curious what the impact has been of having reduced number of seg beds available. Um, that's a great question. So while we haven't reduced our, our need for seg, I mean, we have reduced our need for segregation. There is still um, times when we must use it for behavioral issues, self-protection. Um, so those, those beds are available to us through the special housing piece right now. So those are, we haven't broken them down in, in our post COVID numbers. Um, so while most of the segregation units or restricted housing units have been turned into isolation and quarantine units, we do still have a number of segregation beds available to us for those that may require it based on behavioral issues or a need for protective custody. Um, but I, I've got to say overall, I've been very happy with, with the response of, of the inmate population and how our staff have handled this modified lockdown status throughout our, our, our battle with COVID um, because we have seen a pretty significant reduction in the number of, of uh, disciplinary issues through, through the population, even given the restrictions and the stress placed on, on our population as a result of that. Great, thank you for that. I think it's part of what we're seeing is, you know, some of the silver lining and all, going through all these challenges, what are some of the ways we can learn and see how we can adapt going forward? So I appreciate that yep. insight. Any other questions, other thoughts? So as we move forward in figuring out how to replace our correctional facilities, because that's gonna be whether, it's gonna be there, if not this year, it's, it's there in our future. Um, we really have to think how, how do we go forward in, in a model of really having more flexible use of uh, those beds? Because right now, I mean, you're always going to have infirmary be beds that are not open for the, for the general public. You're going to have booking beds that are not open for the general public. Um, do you do special housing? If we get into, we've got an incarcerated population that's aging, and we've got a lot of medical issues. We've got medical issues. We've got dementia. Uh, we've got um, mobility issues. So do we build beds specifically for a geriatric population? If we do that, then those beds are offline for the general population. Do we continue doing, we'll have to continue at some point, doing something for SEG. You can't have a facility in some ways without some, and I don't wanna say you're gonna be in segregation, but you may have to, sometimes for an inmate's own safety, they request to be taken out of general population and to be placed in a safer environment. So what does that look like? Um, those are the questions that we will be <clears throat> asking in terms of how to make the decision in terms of how we go forward with, do we do standalone facilities that are not connected to each other? Do we do something more like a campus style um, where you have your administrative buildings connected and then you have all the living units separated out over the property. Um, those are decisions we're going to have to make and in the context of how much it's going to cost and over how long a period of time because you don't put up a correctional facility regardless if it's a transitional unit or a transitional facility or a regular incarcerated facility. They don't get up in a couple of months. This is a long-term process that by starting now, you're not gonna see a door opening for at least four or five years. So more time you put off not making a decision, you're saying to the inmates, you're staying where you're staying. Because the, the new door is not gonna open up to them in a few months or a year or two. It's a long process. So, so does this help in giving a little bit of background in terms of what our facilities, their capacity? So when folks sit, see that we've got all these beds and why can't we bring people back from out of state? You've got of the currently right now with post COVID, you've got 1,490 beds in the system, but almost 500 of those are restricted. So you only have 900 plus that's available. 
So that's how you have to look at it. So anything else on this, Al? Just, I know Sarah, Representative Coffey, I know you have your hand up, but one thing that, the that. Other thing we, have to, uh, we have to take into account is planned maintenance as well. And, and one of the things we're looking at is, is the door, pro door control project that was just completed in Newport. It's scheduled for this summer in Springfield. And what that does is that that's gonna take down one unit, a 50 bed unit for approximately six months. At a, you know, so we're, we're gonna be down 50 beds at that point. One thing that's good here that we had, so in Newport, we had to open up the gym to house 50 inmates. I think where we're at right now is we can house those inmates throughout our pocket, throughout our facilities without having to open a gym, but that is gonna be 50 beds that will be down. So we have to take that into account too, as we think about why can't we bring back um, the out-of-state population Again, construction projects are gonna hinder our ability to have that, that free bed space. And if we didn't have that capacity currently, we'd have 50 inmates shipped down to Mississippi for that. Potentially, yes. For that. So Sarah, I didn't have the participant list up, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. It's a quick question. I, the documents that um, you were working off of, Al, I didn't see them on, um, on our website. The, they uh, are. They're on our web page. Maybe you have to refresh. Maybe you have to refresh because they're going to be super useful as we move forward. So thanks. And is it possible to get a breakdown of the B ones um, at some point? Yeah, we can get that. Thank you. Okay. Anything else before we move to the operations cost piece? So is that? You, Matt, or is that you, Al? Uh, Matt's going to handle that one. Okay, so we have a document for that. And oh, before we go there, hang on, we have a question, Michelle. Yeah, so one more question, kind of like the earlier one I asked. I'm wondering um, if you happen to know the number of people that you have currently that are incarcerated because they can't make their bail. I, I don't have that information currently in front of me, but I, that's something else we can get as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so.